He's going to talk about the, the, uh, the food time next weekend. There you go, Edmund. Good morning. Hasn't it been so wonderful so far? Challenging us as parents and also the needs of others in terms of those who are displaced. Well, we are going to be having a wonderful potluck next Sunday. This was something we started last year to have a family potluck just before we uh, get into summer and everybody breaks out going on their vacations. So next Sunday is a family potluck and I would ask that uh, you would only make a dish for yourself and just one family extra. So basically twice as what you would normally make for your family and uh, share it with us as a, a family. Uh, Sunday morning at around uh, by 9.30, I should be here. Uh, you can bring the stuff to the kitchen if you want it to be warmed, or the tables will be set up and you could come and place it there. So it will be open Sunday morning for you to bring and share your uh, meal with us. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, Evan. So once upon a time, there was a barber who had gone to a revival meeting, and uh, he he was so compelled by the, the preacher and by the work of the Spirit in the service that he gave his life to Jesus. And he was radically transformed. I mean, I mean, he had lived such a terrible life beforehand, and after this service, giving his life to Jesus, he just felt overwhelmed. He, he was just full of life and excitement, and he just, like, <clears throat> waking up the next day, it was like everything was brighter. And, and so he was determined that he would give every chance to Jesus, that he would try to find a way that he could share his newfound faith with the people that he was serving. And so he got up that morning and he said, Jesus, I, I'm so excited about what you've done. I'm so thankful for what you've how you've transformed my life. And I'm just asking that when I get to work today as a barber, that you would help me to lead someone to Christ. Give me the opportunity to invite someone into a conversation about faith. And, and so he prayed the prayer and began to think. And, and as he's getting ready for work, he, he began to realize that he, he really hadn't had any experience in sharing his faith. He didn't know the evangelistic tools, and he got quite nervous. Made his way to work, found himself in the barber shop, and his first client's there, and, and his heart's racing, and he's thinking to himself, I've got to share my faith with this individual. I just don't know how. He's prepared the guy. He's got his bib on. He's about to give him a shave, and he's holding the knife just over, the, the, the razor just over the man's throat, and all of a sudden he thinks, I know what to say. And so with the knife over the man's throat, he says to the man, are you prepared to meet God today? Not necessarily the best approach. I, I don't know about you, but I, I have seen all kinds of evangelistic techniques. I, I'm not going to point out any particular church in our city because there are multiple churches that would do this, but there are times that I'm in the byword market, and there are some churches that are down there. There's some who do it very effectively, but there are other individuals who will blast people and scream hell and, and talk about all the negatives, and they make me feel uncomfortable. There are times where I'm walking by, and I'm just like, I don't want people to even know I'm a Christian because of the approaches that they're using. There are all kinds of evangelistic techniques that we've seen over the years, and, and maybe one of the reasons why some of us struggle with sharing our faith is because we've seen so many things that have been so ineffective that we just don't know what to do. It's, it is vital that we figure out the most appropriate way to invite people into a conversation of faith the most appropriate way. And the most appropriate way isn't found in some book or some seminar. I really think the most appropriate way is found in scriptures. And I want you to turn your Bibles today to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, one simple verse that lays out what Paul would suggest is the appropriate invitational path that we need to be focused on. And this is what it says. Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. Very, very simple passage, and you may want to keep your Bibles open. You may want to write some notes about this. Paul's talking to the Thessalonians. They've become Christians. 
And it's so interesting, there's a season prior to this verse where the Thessalonians didn't know Jesus at all. They, 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 were, like, they were just like the average Joe, just knew there was a man named Jesus, had heard about him, but they weren't serving him. And the Bible says that because of some things that Paul did, some approaches he used with this invitational life, that they actually gave their lives to Jesus. They came to believe that he was more than just a man, that he was the son of God. How? How did that happen? I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but each of us, each of us comes to believe certain things in different ways. If if I said to you, do you believe the world is round? How many would raise your, your hands and say yes? The world's round. Just raise your hands. Let's try this, okay? I know. I know. This is like worship. It's hard to get everybody's hands up. All right? Just raise your hands, though. All right. Now, now the truth is, is that there's a lot of hands that have been raised, and I'm pretty sure that none of you are astronauts. I'm pretty sure that none of you have, have been able to, to get into some kind of space sh shuttle and go around the, the world and, and, and actually see for yourself. But you have believed somebody, somebody who's trusted. You, you listen to some things they taught, some, some lectures that they've given, so, some videos or whatever it may be, and you trusted somebody's work. You trusted somebody who was an expert. If I said to you today that I love my wife, you wouldn't go to some scientist or some expert. You would simply watch my life. And, you, and, and you would, I hope you would come to the place where you'd believe that I lo love my wife. Maybe somebody has tried to stir you to do something. Like I try to stir people all the time to do missions. You need to do a short-term mission. And at first, they, they don't believe that they should do a short-term mission, but the more that somebody persuasive gets in their life, they get inspired. And so it's the inspiration that causes them to believe that missions is valuable. There are all kinds of ways that we come to believe in certain things. And when it comes to inviting your friends and your family into a conversation about faith, there are going to be some various ways that they are going to come to believe. And I want you to know there is no one approach that's going to do it. You are going to need to engage in all four of the approaches of which I'm about to talk to you about. So I wanted to talk to you about the four approaches that Paul talks about when it comes to inviting people into faith into a conversation about faith. The first thing is this, what I say, what I say. But Paul starts off and he talks about how people had come to faith in Thessalonica, not just with words, and he goes on to list some other things, but it's so clear that Paul uses words. The very first thing he addresses is the fact that it was words, not just words, but he at least used words. He, 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 didn't just, he didn't just walk around just and have this presence and just hope that someone would just go, I want to give my life to Jesus. He actually used words. It wasn't just words, but he used words. There is something so important about the words that we use. And, and here's the truth, is that some, so many times when it comes to that neighbor who, who, who you want to share your faith with, you want to invite into a faith conversation, the roadblock is what do you say? What, what do you say to somebody? I mean, do you use the Romans road? Do you, do you quote certain scriptures? Do, 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 you, do you go into an apologetics course? Like, what do you say that was going to lead somebody into a full conversation? What, what, do you, what are you going to say? I, to, I told you that sometimes they see in the byword market people who are witnessing. And, and there are people, I watched it the other day, I watched some people very graciously have conversations with some of the people that they were talking to, very kind, they, they used words, that they, they met needs. I, I watched one of the, the, this, somebody from a church come over to somebody who needed something, and they got down and they, they gave the person some money, they said, we actually like to step in and help you out, but we want to talk to you a little bit about our faith, and it was such a gracious thing. But I've also seen individuals who use words that they spoke the truth, but they blasted them. You are going to hell. There is no hope for you except Jesus Christ. I mean, it was just, it was the right, it was true. But the words they said and the way they said it just weren't leading the person to receptivity. I, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to share some words, I'd actually like people to be receptive. Anybody, anybody with me? You, you want people to be receptive, not rejecting. Receptive, not rejecting. So what do we talk about? There's an interesting passage. It's found in Acts chapter 17, verse 22 to 23. It says, Paul then stood up in the meetings of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. 
So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Paul's in Athens. He's been, he's been proclaiming Jesus, not getting a lot of receptivity from people. Finally, there's a stirring in the crowd. And they say, we, we want you to talk to us about, about this thing, this strange new teaching you have. And Paul's got this opportunity to use his words, to, to speak to them about something. He has a chance to say something because he's got their attention. You have a crowd before you, and you've got this opportunity to share faith. What are you going to do? And Paul, Paul says something that every single one of you need to pay attention when it comes to sharing your faith with other people. He speaks to the matter of the heart. Speaks to the matter of the heart. He says this, I've, I've been walking through the city, and I noticed that you have a idol, this, this place of worship, and you've dedicated it to the unknown God. I, I see that there's a level of spirituality inside of you, that you actually desire spiritual things, and you would actually, you would actually acknowledge a God. It, 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 you, you've never defined who this God is, but you've committed your life to this path towards this unknown God. This seems to matter to you. And if it matters so much to you, I'd like to actually tell you the name of the God that you think that you're serving. And he goes on and he begins to talk about Jesus Christ being the Son of God. He talks to them about the heart, uh, about the matter of their heart, the, the desire to worship a God. They didn't know who he was, but it was the desire to be spiritual and worship a God. Friends, listen to me for a second. The roadblock to your friends coming to faith is often a matter of the heart. There are individuals who have faced frustrations with church. There are individuals who have faced, fr faced frustrations in their prayer times, asking God to do certain things that haven't got answered. And these become the matters of the heart. And when you begin to address the matters of the heart, you, you will begin to see a receptivity in people's lives. You see, sometimes we think that we've got to go straight at them with the scripture. But the truth is, is that there are people who don't even believe the Bible is the word of God. There are people who, who don't believe that God exists. And there are things within their heart that they want addressed first. It's like the individual who is, who is just famished and need water. And, and you say, hey, I want to talk to you about faith. And they're like, I, I don't really want to talk about faith until I have the glass of water because that's all I can think about. There is something that's there. And there are matters of the heart that you need to address. I have a friend who, who's in the business world. And a number of years ago, I was in a conversation with him. And, and I had been paying attention to the matters of his heart. He, he's very successful, very goal-oriented. And he wants to reach high levels of success. And so I started to think to myself, what is it that really matters to this individual? What is it that I need to talk about that will lead to a conversation of faith? What are the matters of his heart? What would Paul do? I start to think, I thought, well, I, I could probably talk about success. I could probably talk about his goals. And so I start to talk about that. I said, you know, I, I see you as a very successful individual. You're, you're successful now, and I just see you becoming more successful. That put a smile on his face because that's what he wants. I said, I see that you're very goal-oriented, uh, that, that you will set a goal and you will achieve it, then you'll set a new goal and you'll achieve it. And, and he's like, yeah, that's true. And we start talking about that. And I said, let me ask you a question. What happens when you achieve all your goals? And that just, that just created a question mark in his mind. I said, what happens when you get all your goals? Because you're going to hit them very early in life, I, I believe, because the goals that you're chasing after, that you're working so hard for, those should be reached very, very soon. But what about 30 years from now? And let me even ask you this question. What happens when you get to the end of your road and you're laying on your bed and you're about to breathe your last breath? What are you leaving behind? What's your next goal? What are you talking about? I said, well, this life is, is not just this life. It's much more th than this. And I said, surely you've got goals beyond this planet. Well, all of a sudden the conversation opens up. And I was able to talk about things that were in his heart because he, he didn't want to go through this world without meaning. He didn't want to go through this life without purpose. He wanted to make sure his life was directed in, in a certain direction that would always allow him to pursue something that brought success or significance. And by addressing the matters of the heart, I was able to, to have a conversation of faith. Friends, listen. 
don't jump at people right away with Scripture. I, I mean, there may be times the Spirit will lead you there. Find out what's going on in their hearts. What you say to them will either be rejected or accepted. I want to make sure that what I say is going to give me the best opportunity to be accepted and invite them into a conversation about faith. Talk about the matters of the heart. So what I say is important. The second thing that's important is not only what I say, but what I demonstrate. Paul says it wasn't just with words, but it was with the Holy Spirit and power. And power. I want you to know that the early church lived in this dimension where the Holy Spirit wasn't something for the Sunday morning service really quiet this morning. The Holy Spirit was not just something for the Sunday morning service. There was this belief that the Holy Spirit was to be part of our daily life and that we were to demonstrate the power of the Spirit of God when we were outside of these walls. The the Spirit wasn't just for an altar moment. It wasn't just for goosebumps. It wasn't just for a religious experience, but it was something that would help us to be powerful in the world and demonstrate to the world that Jesus Christ is alive and well. There was this reliance upon the Holy Spirit. There's this passage that I want to just quickly look at. It's found in Acts chapter 13, verses 6 to 12. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Now just listen. Here's this very intelligent ruler, this proconsul, who's asking Paul and Barnabas to talk to him a little bit more about Jesus. It's a good moment. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You should try that at work next next week. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. He believed. When he saw what happened, he believed. This, this religious ruler who, who's in this conversation with Paul and Barnabas, and he's, he's very interested about Jesus. He hasn't committed yet. And he's got this advisory individual, Lemus, who, who, who operates in, in, in an ungodly way. And, and this, this Lemus character is turning to the proconsul and saying, hey, you just don't, don't buy into what these guys say. You, you, this isn't going to help you out in your leadership. This isn't going to help you succeed in life. And Paul gets so frustrated because he realizes that, that there's a roadblock there. He says, let me, let me just deal with this in the supernatural, by the power of the Spirit of God that's upon me. Hey, hey, Lemus, you're going to go blind. This is a great witnessing tool. You're going to go blind. And he calls out what God's about to do, and he immediately, Lemus goes blind. Now, you may be sitting there going, Pastor Jeff, are you surely saying that I need to demonstrate blindness to people? Obviously not. But please listen to me. In case you don't know, this is a Pentecostal church. This is not about being part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, but we believe that something took place on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that the Spirit of God was poured out for the empowering of His church. And we are a church that believes that the Spirit of God wants to work through us supernaturally. We are not a church who believes in just doing things excellently, doing things professionally, doing things with a wow. We believe in that, but that's not it. We believe that the Spirit of God lives in us and that the supernatural can flow through our lives. That's what we believe. I mean, we may not practice it all the time because our belief is probably not as strong as it should be. But we at least state that that's what we believe. And I fully believe it. I have a friend who was youth pastoring a number of years ago. Big, big youth group in this, this one night. Service ends and this kid comes up to the youth pastor, Greg. Teenager says to Greg, he says, hey, I'm new here. And Greg's like, great to meet you. He says, I want to give my life to Jesus. And Greg's like, wow, that's amazing. He, he, he says, what is it? He says, well, let me tell you something. He says, I've never been to this youth group before, 
But one of my friends from high school invited me to come to the youth group. And so I was planning on coming here, and everything was fine. That was my plan. But this morning I woke up, and my grandmother had, I can't remember if it was a heart attack or something significant, some health issue had taken place, and she was rushed to the hospital. And this kid got really quiet, and he said, my, my grandma means a lot to me. And so my family rushed to the hospital, and she was in, very bad, in a very bad condition. And I, I, was, I was so worried I was going to stay at the hospital. And my, my parents encouraged me to, to just leave it with the doctors, leave the, my grandma with the doctors, and come to youth tonight. I wasn't going to come, but I decided to come. But I got to tell you, Pastor Greg, I got to tell you that while I was in the, in the singing time, I was so worried about my grandmother. That's all I could think about. Then we finished the singing, and you had to shake hands. And this kid from the other side of the room came, came over across the room. I had never met him before. He shook my hand, and he said, hey, I just, I just want to I just wanna say something to you. God wants you to know that everything's going to be fine with your grandmother. You don't need to worry about it. He's with you. And then the kid shook my hand and went back to his seat. He said, I've never met this kid before. I didn't tell anybody in this youth group that my grandmother was sick. But if that can happen tonight, then I believe God's here and I want to give him my life. Friends, I want to tell you that I am not Pentecostal because I have my credentials with the PAOC. I don't preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit because that's the thing I'm supposed to do. I am absolutely convinced that the Spirit of God wants to work through our lives in a supernatural way so that we can demonstrate the power of God to people who may not accept Christ unless they see the miracles. You're, you're thinking, well, what do I do? Every day, wake up, say, Holy Spirit, would you lead me today? Listen to his voice. When somebody at work or a neighbor has a sickness or a situation, offer to pray. And don't pray these prayers that, that make our God so small. Friends, pull your faith up. Our God is a big God, and he wants to do more than we believe that he wants to do. Let's believe that he can heal cancer. Let's believe that he can restore marriages. Let's believe that he can break bondages. Let's believe for things that they need you to believe in. And pray those prayers over their lives and watch and see what God will do. Paul says it was by the Spirit and by power. What I demonstrate, what I say, what I demonstrate. Number three, how I make you feel. Paul says with deep conviction. With this full assurance, full confidence. I want you to understand this, is that Paul, Paul is standing before a group of people. This group of people, that they've heard about this Jesus. They, they, they have not been interested in this Jesus. They are like your friends and my friends. They are like your family and my family. They, they've heard about him. They're just not interested. And Paul, Paul's in this place where, where he doesn't know what to do. He speaks words, speaks demonstration of the power of the Spirit, and then the Bible says with deep conviction, he stands with utter assurance, and he begins to say, share something with them that, that causes their hearts to move from a cold place to a warm place, causes their hearts to become open to the message. What did he share with such conviction that would cause them to change their minds? Very, very simple, friends. Paul told his story. Pa Paul told his story. It's found in Acts chapter 22, verse 3 to 10. Very quickly, he says, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecute the followers of the way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in the prisons as the high priest and all the council all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as it came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth. Whom you are persecuting, he replied. My comp companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. Friends, 
This is just a, one of the places where Paul shared a story, but if you look, look at Paul's journeys, he keeps telling his story over and over again. You want to make people less rejecting of you? You want people to open their hearts to make them feel positive towards you? Then tell your story. T- tell it with deep conviction. I, I, listen, I don't have all the answers. I, I don't know all the things that you're asking. Yeah, there's times I, I don't understand why, why, why God allows suffering in the world. Yeah, I don't understand why, why a teenage girl gets pregnant, but a very faithful lady who, who, who's served God all her life can't get pregnant. I don't understand it. But I got to tell you about my story. I want to tell you with deep conviction what Jesus did for me. I, I want to tell you about the changes in my life. And friends, you want to make someone feel more receptive to you. You want them to to not be in a defensive place, but in an embracing place, a place where their heart is open. Tell your story. I was just like you. I was, I rejected, this is what Paul says, I rejected the gospel. I, I was persecuting the church. I was completely against the church. Listen, friends, you think, you think that you don't like this Jesus? I was arresting people. I was so opposed to the faith. I was arresting people. But then one day I met Jesus. One day I met Jesus and he changed everything. And and Paul begins to change how they feel about the gospel because he shares from deep conviction, full assurance from his own story. Friends, we've got to tell our story. We've got to tell people about the difference that Jesus made inside of us. I remember when we were living in Port Hope, I was over at our friend's place. I'm sure I've shared this before. We're sitting down this one night, it's our second time hanging out with this couple, and I'm sitting there, and so my friend Mark wants to ask me some questions about faith, and he's got lots of questions. And I realized that I'm, 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 I don't have all the answers for him. And so I finally just thought, I'm just going to share my story. I said, let me, let me just tell you about what Jesus means for me. I started to talk about how, how I was raised in a Christian home and how I, at the, uh, the age of seven and a half, my dad and mom split up and my, my dad went with another lady and, and, and we found ourselves in poverty. I, I began to talk about how, how we had moved to Oshawa and there were times we didn't have the food and yet God showed up miraculously. I start to share about how when I was a teenager, about how, how I, was, I was just so, so casual. I just came to church and did things, but God got a hold of my heart, and he started to actually speak to me. I started to talk about the experiences I had, and I began to talk about what Jesus meant to me. And as I'm telling my story, do you know what he did? He leapt forward and said, that's what I want. That's what I want. I made him feel jealous for what I was having. Friends, you don't need to have all the answers for your friends, but you do need to tell your story. You do need to tell what Jesus means to you, about the times he stepped in, about that time I was living in uh, on Totten Road, and we had no food in the fridge, and I didn't know what we were going to do. My mom didn't know what we were going to do, and so she gathered us together and said, let's pray, and all of a sudden, there's a, there's a buzz at our, at our apartment front door, and this lady from our church felt the Spirit of God say, go buy the hill, you're some groceries. And baskets arrived. And I told story after story like that. Tell your story. How you make the... You see, they, they may become defensive about, about the straight-up apologetic method. But they will be receptive and not argue against your story. Because it's your story. May, how you make them feel. Tell your story. Lastly, how I live. How I live. Paul says, you know how I lived among you for your sake. And what it really means is what I became amongst you on account of you. Let me say this. No one will want to serve your Jesus unless they see this transformative power of Jesus in your life. Friends, no one will want to serve your Jesus or want to have a conversation about the need to serve your Jesus unless they see the transformative power of Jesus in your life. Uh, uh, Please listen. We are not called to just be nice people. That's being Canadian. They must see the transformative nature of Christ inside of you. There must be something of your life that they closely examine that will create a conversation. It was what he lived, what Paul lived. There was something that was different from the rest of society. And 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 my fear, I'm, I'm... preaching this morning, I know that, but my fear for the church 
is that we are so excited about being accepted in society that we will adjust our lifestyle every single day so that we look like the rest of the world, so that when we get together with people, invite them to church, they go, why would we ever do that? You look and sound and do exactly what we do. There is no difference in you than us. And nothing of our life compels them towards Jesus Christ. Friends, I'm appealing to you today that some of us need to make some changes in our life that when we're together with those people who get drunk, that we need to live in such a way that says, no, I don't need that because I've got Jesus. That when we get together with those people who are talking about the other women in the office, and even though they're married, that there's something that rises up inside of us that doesn't even put a smile on our face that says, I want to talk to you about what it means to be faithful to my wife. I'm talking about something that's so transformative because of Jesus Christ. Do we fail? Yes. Do we have doubts at times? Yes. But either Jesus has made us a new creation or we're not even Christians. The transformative nature of Jesus Christ should lead people to see something different about our lives. I remember when I was pastoring in Pembroke, one Sunday morning, had an incredible experience. You see, what had happened was, these two teenagers in our youth group had got saved, a brother and sister. They, they had been coming for a little while. Their parents weren't saved, and, and so they didn't know how to get nurtured in the things of faith. And so my wife and I had to pull them in and kind of pour into their life. And there were days that were good, and there were days that were bad, because they're on the journey. After about two months, though, they were growing in their faith. And this one Sunday morning, I was leading worship. I know that sounds like a ridiculous thing, and it really was. But I was leading worship on the Sunday morning and I felt the Spirit of God say to me there are people who would need to get saved in the service. So I presented the appeal and a handful of people came forward and got saved. It was a great moment. Continued on with the service, pastor preached. And we ended up out in the foyer. Jason's dad came over to me and he said, hey, I need to talk to you. I was like, okay. He said, I, I thought this morning when you were talking during the singing time, that you were talking to me. I said, I I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean. He said, you know, you ask people if they want to give their lives to Jesus? I said, yeah. I want to give my life to Jesus. I was like, oh, that's easy. Let's make that happen now. I pulled him into the library. I said, just tell me what, what's going on. He said, he said, Pastor Jeff, I've watched my son and daughter for the last two months. I, I, I know, I, I, they're, they're my kids. I, I know that nobody's perfect, but I've watched something take place in their life I have seen the change in them. I know the way they were before. They weren't terrible kids, but I know the way they were before, and I know the way they are now. And Pastor Jeff, there is something so different about their life that I want to give my life to Jesus. Friends, I want to tell you that Jesus is calling you to live so differently than the rest of your friends and your unsaved family that when they look at you, when they look at you, they are curious about your Jesus. They won't listen to your message if they don't see something in your life. And I start to think, well, what does it take? And, and I think one of the good starting places is found in Galatians chapter 22, or ch chapter 5, verse 22. There's no 22 chapters in Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Oh, friends, love on people like crazy. Love on the people who don't love on you. Joy. Uh, let, me, let me just say this right now. Some of you need to get a little joy in your life. I mean, I, I mean, there's some of you, you're telling people about Jesus and the look on your face tells them that this Jesus makes you more depressed. I mean, you need to get some joy. Joy, forbearance, this ability to persevere in the midst of difficulties, not going around complaining, oh, life is tough, I've got this issue, I've this issue, oh, woe is me, I'm just trusting in Jesus. No, this forbearance, this perseverance, uh, yeah, yeah, things are tough, but I just trust God. This kindness. Stepping into people's lives and showing them unbelievable kind, speaking life to people. I, I can't, I can't t preach on this enough. Our society is more apt to cut people down than it is to lift people up. And don't just show kindness with your actions, show kindness with your words. Goodness. There is such goodness in who you are. The, the, the things that are in your heart and in your mind are good. They're of God. 
faithfulness, that, you would, that when you say, this is what I'm going to do, you do it. When you say, I'm, I'm going to be here, you're, you're there. Faithfulness, gentleness, that, that there's, there's a softness. I, I, I mean, this is an area that I, I can be impatient at times. This gentle response to people. And then self-control. This is huge. There are times where we just live in our liberties because we just know that God's going to forgive us for things. Friends, let's learn self-control. We don't need every show in our minds. We don't need to watch every movie that's out there, even if people are recommending it. We don't need to, to, to have the excesses of food or drink or whatever. We need to learn self-control. Our self-control speaks of the work of the Spirit in our lives. Can I, can I just give you a little catchy line? People need to see the fruit of the Spirit a lot more than a bunch of spiritual fruits. Some of you are getting that now. Spiritual fruits are, are people who, who proclaim Jesus Christ but don't live anything like the Galatians 5.22. They, they, they're, they're impatient and they're unkind and, and they lack self-control, but they're out there and they're talking about the things of the Spirit. They don't need a bunch of spiritual fruits. They need to see the fruit of the Spirit. The way I live. Pastor Steve, would you come back? When I was a kid, teenager, we, we, you know, you'd always hang out with people. And I'd get phone calls from a friend and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to do something. We're going to go out here. An invitation. And I would ask a few questions before I said yes. Well, who's going? That's important. Because if they told me about a bunch of people that I hated hanging out with, I, I didn't really want to go. Or I might say, well, what are we going to eat? That was important for me. Are we having pizza? Are we going down to the south end of Oshawa and having chips? Chip truck? Or... What are we going to do? We're just going to watch. I don't want to watch a movie. We're going to play soccer. I'm in. What am I going to do? There were these trigger things that allowed me to accept the invitation. And friends, when it comes to this invitational life of engaging people with the things of the Spirit and having spiritual conversations, as we invite people into a conversation, there are going to be triggers that are going to be different from each person. For some, it's going to be what we say, hearts of the matter. For some, it's going to be what we demonstrate, power of the Holy Spirit, supernatural. For some, for some, it's going to be how we live. Friends, there are all kinds of triggers that we pull people in. And God wants you in the ideal world to use as many of them as possible. Don't be freaked out about sharing your faith. But do what Paul said, did. He talked about words, the Holy Spirit and power, the deep conviction, how you make people feel, and the way you live. And as you use each of those things in your invitations, people will be much more receptive to hearing about Jesus Christ. My prayer is, is that as we apply this, that we would have conversations with people who are ready to know Jesus. And that this place would be filled with your friends and your family and they would be transformed. Friends, I, I want, I, my prayer for this series is that you would have a vision of your friends sitting beside you in church. Because if you don't have that vision, then what is this all about? God might as well just kill us and take us to heaven. Unless we live with purpose to get the kingdom out there and live this invitational life. Would you stand? I'm going to ask that our prayer team would just come forward very quickly. Bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to ask two questions this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed. <laughs> You're in this place this morning and you don't know this Jesus. You don't know this Jesus. <clears throat> but you've been in the service and there's something you sense or maybe you've been trying to go your own path and you, you, you've, you've made some decisions that, that are, are just so far off track. You've sensed that there's an emptiness in your life. And this morning you'd say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I need him to be in control and turn this mess around. I need him to fill this emptiness. I need him to be in my life. I need Jesus. If that's you, just raise your hand very quickly. Just raise your hand. Just you and me looking. Raise your hand. Just wave it at me. Scan across the audience really quickly. Is there anybody here this morning? Last chance. Spirit of God speaking to you. All right. 
If you didn't raise your hand, but you'd like some more information, want to talk to somebody, I'd invite you to come to the front, to one of the people here at the front, one of our prayer team members. I'm going to close in prayer in just a second, but friends, listen. If you need prayer, I'm going to invite you to come to the front and have someone pray for you, whether it's a physical healing, emotional healing, maybe you need the power of the Spirit in your life, I, I don't know, but whatever you need. If, if you want to just step out, you can do that right now. If you want to just step out right now, just, you just need prayer. Just feel free to step out. And as we leave, I want to challenge this church to find ways to invite people into conversation. Find ways, find appropriate invitations. So Jesus, today, we, we don't end with this big emotional altar call. We, we want to live out what Paul lived out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. I, I pray that we would use words, God that we would talk about the heart of the matter. For some people, it will be an intellectual obstacle, and that's what's in their heart, and we're going to need to do some study for sure or, or engage in some conversation. But God, let us talk about the things that matter to people's hearts. I, I pray, God, that, that not only will we do that, but we would truly rely on the Spirit of God. Paul, Paul relied on the Holy Spirit over and over again. The early church did. Let us demonstrate the power of the Spirit. Let us pray for people and believe for people. I pray that, God, that we would speak with deep conviction to help them to have warm hearts by telling our story, how we make them feel. Let us recognize the power of our story. And lastly, Lord, let this week be a week where we show people how we live, that there would be something so different about us, the fruits of the Spirit would be in our lives, that they would begin to question what it is that makes us so different. Help us. Help us to live in a way that will draw people to Jesus. And I pray that every day we would have a vision of our friends who don't know Christ, our family who doesn't know Christ, sitting beside us in church with their arms raised, giving you glory. Let that be something that stirs our hearts every single day. So Jesus, be with our church. I thank you so much for them. Bless them, I pray, this week. Use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everyone.